another time for some people to get naps and some people to not. How many got their nap in today? How many wish they got their nap in today? <laughs> Our hymn tonight, number 409. I know whom I have believed. Four oh nine. I was about to say, I don't think it was right, but <laughs> all right. I I I know not why God's wondrous grace to me hath made known. Nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing man of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair. Nor if I walk the fell with him, or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. Pray for us, please. Dear Lord, open our hearts to hear the words mm. that you have for us tonight. Open our minds and our eyes to see you. Mm. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Calvin. Calvin, can I use that little podium behind you and then just Thanks. thank you? Well, let's turn in our Bible to Ruth chapter 1. We'll continue. Thanks, Calvin. Come up there. Appreciate that. Love to be as close as possible anytime I can. So I uh, I was watching the Falcons. Did anybody else watch that football game? If you're a Falcons fan, it was very disappointing. How can they give up 17 points in 10 minutes? How can they just seem, you know, they're the best team in football for three quarters. They just unfortunately forget there's a fourth quarter. I mean, that started in the Super Bowl six years ago. Bless their hearts. So, anyhow, um, it was a good afternoon. It was a restful. Hopefully, yours was as well. Um, this section, we want to go ahead and read through the rest of Ruth uh, chapter 1. And uh, what uh, at the end, um, certainly I want to give time for questions with the first chapter. So, if you have some or comments... But I also, I want to play a song for you. Um, the song is called Land of the Living by Matthew Perryman Jones. Has anyone ever heard that song before? 
was not a real popular one. It was on the radio for a little bit, at least on some of the Sirius XM channels back four or five years ago. Um, but I'll tell a little bit of background about the, 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 the writer and, and the musician who performs it is from uh, Decatur, Georgia. Uh, actually grew up very close to where I grew up. And, and um, I heard the song and uh, I was so intrigued by it because it had such a powerful message. Because when you listen to it, there's, there's four biblical references that he makes. Now, it's not, a, again, he didn't write it to be a Christian song, but there are these four very distinct biblical references. And you hear it. So anyway, um, there was a movie that came out that uh, made it into some theaters, um, and I was able to go see it. Um, it's called Manchester by the Sea. Um, it's, it's, it's a really real-life movie, but it's not an easy movie to watch. Um, it's very depressing. I don't know any other way to say it. Um, it's, it's very real, um, but uh, uh, I, uh, when the movie ended in the theater, some lady said, wow, I need Prozac. I mean, it's, that was that kind of movie. It was just very, it, you know. Uh, but anyhow, I was watching, seeing the previews. I'm hearing the song, and so I just Googled who Matthew Perryman Jones is, and I see he's playing at a place called Alley's Attic in Decatur, Georgia. And uh, I was actually working for a mission organization uh, up on the mountain, Fort Mountain, which is between LJ and Chatsworth, Georgia. And so I bought a ticket for like 12 bucks. And, I, and on, it's because it's, this is on, I'm seeing this on Saturday. The concert's on Tuesday. So Tuesday, I drive into Atlanta. I go to Alley's Attic, which is a big kind of event center, can hold maybe 150 people for, for a venue. Um, one of the best hamburgers I've ever eaten. But anyway, so I'm enjoying the, the, the meal. And um, anyway, in the midst of the concert, um, Matthew Perryman Jones talks, starts kind of actually telling a story he had not planned to tell. Now, let me just back it up. This is by way of introduction, by the way. Uh, kind of back that up. Three weeks before, up on the mountain, teaching at this mission center place, there was a gathering of four people who had been involved in youth ministry or student ministry at a very high level, and together, like, their total knowledge exceeded 200 years. It was just these lifers who'd been... One of them's name was Barry St. Clair. Barry St. Clair out of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, had an organization called Reach Out. It's still going. He just retired a few years ago, but a great organization, produced a lot of material, a lot of really good stuff. Well, so Barry's one of the guys that's there, and we... We'd, we had met each other multiple times before, had a lot of mutual friends. And um, so we're talking, and in the conversation, he was, uh, we're, we're just kind of, you know, spitballing people. Uh, I mentioned Keith Naylor, and he said, oh, you know, Keith was the youth pastor in the church that we planted there in Clarkston, Georgia. And I said, no. I said, Keith spoke at a youth revival when I was 15 that me and four other guys went to our pastor and said, hey, can we do this youth revival? We want to do something to reach students. And, and God was really moving in our community at multiple churches. And so we wanted to, and the pastor was very supportive of it. And so the guy who was, who was just teaching myself and my brother and these other guys were going through this discipleship group, he spoke two nights and then he, got, he said, hey, this guy named Keith Naylor. And so Keith came and spoke two nights. Well, the last night, which was Wednesday night, Keith gave an invitation. And the invitation was just, if you feel like, you know, that, that if you want to just, you know, come forward to say, hey, I want my life to be used for the kingdom in some way, form, or fashion. Just come down. We'll pray for you. For me, when I went down, it was in that at 15 that I felt the first stirrings of being called to ministry. So I always go back to that moment, standing in a church about this, this size when I was 15, that this six foot six basketball star named Keith Naylor had preached this challenging message and prayed over a group of about 20 of us. And I'd go back and say that was, that was the kind of significant time where I felt God calling me toward, toward ministry or beginning that, that call. Well, so uh, in the conversation with Barry, uh, we were talking about Keith and I shared that with him and he said he said did you know did you know Keith passed away just a few months ago and I said no I didn't it was shocking he had, he had had eight children well his oldest child had died and he, he just it, he couldn't get over it he went into a pretty deep state of depression he did not self-harm but most people just believe he really just died of a broken heart it just it just broke him so bad 
And so we're, we're talking about that and we're sharing. Now, so, okay. so that's now fast forward to I'm down the mountain in Decatur at Ali's Attic about maybe four or five weeks later. And Matthew Perryman Jones is singing. And, after, and so during the midst of the concert, he goes off script. And he says, well, I had not planned on doing this, but uh, a really good friend of mine named Keith died uh, just a couple months ago. And um, basically he starts sharing man, just his life story, starts sharing his testimony to this, this group of people. Uh, and he said, back when I was, uh, when I was a young um, teenager, some stuff, bad stuff happened to me. And he said, um, just really messed me up. And I got into some things. And there was this group of people that I got connected to. And, uh, and he never, like, was sharing Christ, but he started talking about this group that had really reached out to him and had helped him. And he said, and so we'd start coming down here, and we played here at Alley's Attic. And, the, and, and I always felt like I wanted to be a therapist to try and help those after. And he said, God helped me through this very difficult time. And uh, he said, uh, but I was challenged by my friend Keith to use the songs I was writing even as a 18-year-old to help and to, to, to try and minister to others was the words he used. And uh, he said, uh, Keith just died, and he said, he, said, and he, he said, like, nearly 30 years ago, for the very first time, uh, Keith would always sing, he pushed me out onto this stage. And by this time, like, he's weeping, and I'm thinking, is this Keith Naylor, the same Keith that, you know? And uh, so he's just, just kind of, you know, sobbing and weeping and saying, the reason I'm doing everything I do today was because this guy pushed me out in front here at this event. So after the show, you know, it wasn't, again, it's not, it wasn't like a lot of people there, but I, I, I waited to chat with him, and I just walked up. I said, no, you don't know who I am. My name's Bill Jessup. I grew up in Decatur, then moved to Loganville. The Keith where you were talking about, was that Keith Naylor? And he, he just, eyes just, you know, he said, you know, Keith, and I, and I shared with him my story, and it was like instantly, I mean, he just hugged me, and it was like this instant bond of God's grace. So when you play, when we play this song kind of at close, I think it's a very appropriate song. I pray it ministers to your heart. Um, it's, it's ministered to me multiple times over. And as we're going through it, when, when you hear a biblical reference, we'll throw up our fingers and we'll just we'll come back to them just as a way of, of, of encouragement. So anyway, just wanted to share that with you, a way of introduction. Also, it always reminds me that God always puts us where he wants us. He connects dots, right? He's just times you don't even know. Who I never would have thought that I'd be here tonight getting the privilege of sharing this here. It's amazing how one thing leads to another to where... God, we don't know the steps he has for us. But if we'll be faithful to walk where he wants us to walk, we will get to enjoy what he has for us. And That is exactly right. And amen to that. And, and unfortunately at times, just like with Emiliac and with, with Naomi, they led their sons to a place they shouldn't have. But praise God, this, the end of chapter 1 begins the fact they journey, start journeying back home. And, um, and even in the midst of the brokenness, God brings forth Ruth. And, and, and so His redemption is so triumphant even over our sin. And I'm so grateful to rejoice in God's goodness of that. So as we read, let us keep that constantly in this story. Picking up in verse 6, then meaning, uh, then she, meaning Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard that the fields, so excuse me, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord, and I may start using Yahweh, the, the he, just, just by way of expressing in this, She's meaning the covenant-keeping God, okay? So when I use that, I think it kind of helps with understanding this. That Yahweh had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughter-in-laws, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, 
return each of you to her mother's house. May Yahweh deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead, meaning her husbands, and with me. Yahweh grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband, meaning a future spouse for them. She's, she's literally asking God to bless them to go back and to, and to have a husband and to bear children and to have a family. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more. So the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty, that would be better translated, maybe translated Elohim, God who created us. For Elohim has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and Yahweh has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when Yahweh has testified against me, and the Almighty, or Elohim, has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth and the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Sometimes we don't know what we are missing until we actually find what once we had is now gone. In 1911, the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre in Paris, France. Taken. Two years during the time they looked to search for the Mona Lisa, finally finding it and returning it, more people came in those two years to see a blank wall than had come the previous two years to witness the masterpiece. Why? Because most of us don't really realize how beautiful something is until it's gone. And that's what it was with Naomi. She didn't know what she had, even in the midst of the duress and distress of the famine, until her family had been taken away from her. There's three specific themes that develop in this section to carry off of what we started this morning. These themes deal with relationships, repentance, and reconciliation. Now, when it comes to relationships, I want you to see how Ruth and um, Orpha differ just a little bit. Um, Robert Hubbard, in his commentary on Ruth, makes this phenomenal statement in this section. Listen to what he says. Ruth, the extraordinary and unexpected. Thus, Ruth models an adventurous faith, one willing to abandon the apparently sensible and venture into unknown territory. Whatever her motives, deep affection, a sense of loyalty, misguided idolism. 
she sacrificed her destiny to cling to an aged, hopeless mother-in-law. One may understand Orpah. One must emulate Ruth. I think he's spot on with that. When you see the story, everything would make sense for Ruth to return back to her home. Naomi, she's bitter, she is broken, she doesn't know what else to do, but what she has heard is that Yahweh again has restored grain in the land of her home, and she needs to return. She wants to return. There's nothing for her in Moab. She should have never went there to begin with. So she tells her daughter-in-laws, I'm returning home, and it would be good for you to go. They don't want to. I mean, both of them cling to her to begin with. It's even as though it appears that she journeys and they're with her and she finally stops them to say, I, I, can't, I can't provide for you. I cannot give for you what you are looking for. And she tries to encourage them to go. Eventually, Orpah kisses her and does. She goes back. And, and listen, no one should fault her. No one should have hardship or heartache to think, wow, you know, that she was in some way not honoring her mother-in-law. And in this situation, we would completely understand. But as understanding as we might be, to look at Ruth, the faith, the trust, the courage, the conviction, this is who should be emulated. This is a testimony that is beautiful and precious beyond exception. It is something for which all of us can look at to be reminded, to have our own faith stirred by the, by the intoxication of Ruth's commitment, not just to her mother in law but to the God of her mother-in-law, of her first husband, and her first husband's uh, father. So there was something special. So as we look at this, these three themes, the first one is to look at relationships. Ruth values the idea of covenant relationship. You see that with her. You see in the way she approaches it. You see in verses 15 through 18, unless death separates us, let nothing come between us. It is in these uh, verses that for the first time in verse number 8, Naomi says to her daughter-in-law, Go return each of you to his mother's house, and may the Lord deal kindly with you. That word deal kindly is that word hesed. It denotes loyalty, reliability, kindness, and compassion. It is associated with God's covenant relationship to His people the nation of Israel. It is that word for which Naomi trying to impress that the children, that these daughter-in-laws leave, that that Ruth says, no, Hesed is a two-way street. You have shown me this kind of loving kindness. You want the best for me. You're not expecting me to take this journey back with you, but I want to. I want to be with you. The same loving kindness that is coming and being spurned out of your actual probably bitterness. For me, it's out of love. I want to be there for you. I don't want to leave you. And so this idea comes forth where Ruth emulates the very thing for which God emulates to His people. Here is a woman who is broken, who is hurt, who is bitter, who is angry, and yet Ruth presses on to her hesed, even when she probably does not deserve it. Ruth's faithfulness comes out. I love, this is sort of just my thoughts, Ruth, Ruth's, Ruth's view of her relationship with Naomi. I'm not giving up on you even when others give up on you. Orpha was willing to leave. Ruth was willing to stay. Second, I'm not giving up on you even when you've given up on yourself. Ruth's relationship to Naomi. And let's be honest. It would be expected for Orpha to leave. It would be expected that Ruth should have. But when Ruth looks at her mother-in-law and says, I know you may have given up on yourself, but I've not given up on you. She speaks hesed over her life. Boy, that is a testimony for what the church needs to display one to another. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, 
This is not her biological mom. As a matter of fact, she's leaving her biological mom. This is a powerful statement of Hesed. It is loving compassion put on display. And um, I think when we see this, we know what it's like for others to give up on us. We've all experienced that. Probably in truth, we've all experienced the fact that we've given up on ourselves at times. Yet when someone who walks with you, who knows your frailty and your brokenness, says, I'm not giving up on you, it goes in a long way, um, speaking the very love of Christ. Verse 21 <clears throat> When Naomi comes back, she says, I went away full when she's come back into the town and she's told everyone, stop calling me Naomi, means blessed one. Call me Mara, bitter, for Elohim has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and Yahweh has brought me back empty. I think there's one other statement I can make. I'm not giving up on you even when you mistreat me. I went away full, but I've come back empty. How would you have liked to have been Ruth when Naomi says, I went away full, but now I'm back empty, and Ruth is standing right there. Here she's already pledged her allegiance and fidelity and love and support, and yet I don't even acknowledge your presence. I mean, it's one thing to give up on someone when someone else has given up on them. It's another thing to give up on someone when they've given up on themselves. It's another thing not to give up on someone when they've mistreated you. And clearly, that was Ruth's testimony. Let's be very honest. We can sing that easier than put it into practice. We can listen to that and nod our heads easier than it is to put into practice. It's difficult when we've been mistreated, to show the effectual love of God, Hesed, to other people or to those who have hurt us. So the first thing we see is by way of relationship, this, this word, this term, this key component, Hesed, coming forth. Second, repentance. Verses 12 and 13 remind us of the spiritual funk Naomi was in. Turn back, my daughters. Go your way. I'm too old to have a husband. Would you wait until they are grown, even if I did? Now, let's look at how she got into this spiritual funk. Her husband, Abimelech, literally means my father is king. Bethlehem means house of bread. And yet, although her husband's name testified to God's provision in the town they lived in, testified to God's provision... When famine came, they left God's provisional hand to trust in their own hands. Their sons, Malon and Chilion, Chilion, are both actual Canaanite names, not Hebrew names. It seems that for, if you read through the book of Judges, and by the way, some have believed that, that Emiliac, and uh, Naomi are actually a part of the tribe that would have come down from Caleb. I don't know that to be true or not, uh, just, but there's some speculation in some of the commentaries. But what we do know is that when you read through the book of Judges, with everyone doing what was right in their own eyes, with all the warring that took place within the tribes and through other nations, that they were in a mess, the people. They, 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 the testimony of the final words of the book of Judges was quite right. They did what was right in their own eyes. They sought for themselves what was good for themselves and did not keep God's commands or His law as a part of them. Even so much that they took identity of other people. Your name represented something significant in your tribe, in your nation. So... So for them to be to have the Canaanite name seems to indicate that even Naomi and Emiliac's relationship wasn't strong to begin with in what they perceived of naming their children and what that would look like by way of its testimony. So I wrote down a couple of things that are need to be seen by way of repentance. And so here's, here are the thoughts. 
one's failure to be repentant, which means to agree with God and change my attitude and action. One's failure to be repentant hinders us from seeing God's promises clearly. The failure to be repentant, it clouds our ability to see God's truth. For here's the, here's the reality. Naomi should have known the idea of a kinsman redeemer was something that God had in His Word as a provision for what would happen in just this scenario. That the fact that you can have things redeemed through a kinsman redeemer. In other words, you don't have to bear another son that would grow up for these daughter-in-law to marry. Is that a near kinsman can come and redeem that for you. That was given in God's law as a provision. But what will unrepentant sin practice in lives do? It will not see God's word clearly. It fogs the mind and the heart from being broken and repentant. Repentant people see God's truth because the Holy Spirit illuminates that truth within us. But those who are walking in darkness, who do not want God's Word to be a lamp into their feet and a light into their path, will stumble. Why? Because the darkness is what surrounds them. And it's easy for us to see believers who find themselves, more often than not, when, 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 when someone looks up and sees that they've drifted so far away, they never intended to make those decisions to hurt people. They never intended to destroy their life that way. They never intended or planned to go that far. What seemed right in the moment in their own eyes was, was just a little step or a slip away. Now they find themselves miles adrift, not seeing clearly because of an unrepentant spirit and heart. Here's the beautiful thing about repentance. When we agree with God, as believers, the Holy Spirit who indwells, when we agree with a holy God who indwells us, that His Word is right and righteous and true, and repent, agree that our actions are wrong, that our attitudes are wrong, and ask in brokenness and repentance for God to open our eyes to see clearly, all of a sudden, the light shines. All of a sudden we go, Yes, Lord, I agree with you. How could I have been so foolish? And that's the beauty of what repentance does. It clears the fog. It is like, for me, a good cup of coffee first thing in the morning. It just breaks the fog up. That's what repentance does for the heart and soul. Second, repentance is taking responsibility for one's actions instead of trying to cover them. Repentance is taking responsibility for one's actions instead of trying to cover them. In Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. What did Ruth want to do? She wanted to get rid of her daughter-in-laws partly because going home She did not want the sinfulness of her children and her husband's choices following her. I can get rid of my daughter-in-laws and the testimony of my sons marrying the Moabite women, which was not in and of itself wrong, but not highly valued or looked at. I can make that go away if they don't go back with me. That's exactly right. You're exactly right. There, there, oh, yes, there's, there, there, was, there was definitely major issues between those two nations um, and the bordering, the bordering Israeli, you know, Israel nation, the nation of Judah there with them. So what is repentance for us? Because here's the truth as believers. All of us are still falling short. None of us live in such a way as perfection. We are, in fact, the, there's an old song, I say old from the 1980s, that, that, that I guess is old these days, but, but it said, the closer I get to you, the more I see I'm a stranger to your holiness. The reality is that the closer we do draw to the Lord, the more we see our brokenness, the more we see our failures, the more we see and desire 
to live repentantly, agreeing with God, acknowledging our sin, letting mercy flow as we confess and forsake. The beauty of repentance is it keeps one's heart sensitive to living righteously and enjoying God's favor. Or else we start justifying and rationalizing sin. And that's the last thing that we want to do. And then finally, reconciliation. The rest of the book begins the theme of reconciliation. Verse 18 is the starting point. That Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her. So she would not push her away any further. The beauty of this kind of reconciliation is that Ruth is saying to her, no matter what you've done and no matter how you treat me, the only thing that will separate us is death. I love that in verse 17, Ruth, the Moabite, reminds Naomi, the Hebrew, of a powerful truth. May Yahweh do so to me and more if anything but death parts me from you. May the God, the only true and living God, who has made a covenant with His people for which I have come to believe and surrender, although I didn't grow up as this being my God or my people, I have come to trust Yahweh. And I submit myself to the fact that His provision will be good. And so I will not leave you nor forsake you until death separates the two. This is the testimony for which the book of Ruth unfolds. Yes, it's a beautiful love story, as we'll jump into with with Naomi, I mean, excuse me, with Ruth and Boaz. It's a beautiful moment of reconciliation and restoration. But we don't want to miss the beauty of what Hesed is being conveyed this kind of loving kindness that Ruth is showing her mother-in-law, who honestly, in some moments, just doesn't deserve it. But Ruth still lovingly lavishes upon her. So I can't wait. Um, uh, I have the privilege. I'll, I'll be back with you in a couple weeks. Not next week. I'm in Florida speaking at a church there. But look forward to being back in a couple weeks, and we will pick back up and continue to walk through. And may God give us grace to enjoy this book. And I do hope that maybe through, in your own personal time, uh, maybe give it a chance to read a couple times over. Any questions or comments or other thoughts about, about Ruth? Well, she was in the lineage of Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's part of the most amazing thing, is that um, both Rahab um, and Ruth... Um, these foreigners uh, play a significant role in the lineage, in the testimony. She is, she is yes. Uh, so we see that. That's, again, especially coming out of this morning, I wouldn't want us to have seen this morning's message without looking ahead to chapter 4 with God. And, and what can we say, even in the midst of the sinful, destructive patterns for which Emiliac and Naomi set for their children and themselves? is that God in His providence was still working graciously. He said, my ways are not your ways. And he, he, my and he is faithful and good to work even in the midst. The Bible I was using this morning spells uh, A-I-L-L-I-N and it means to pronounce. I thought it was Chilean, but you just say it in Chilean. Chilean, uh-huh. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. And, and to be honest with you, sometimes some of the enunciation of what we're doing with languages that have not been around for quite some time is our best English translation, but Chilean, Chilean. It's right, for uh, Amimelech is not, I'm not doing that justice. It'd be easier to just say Eli, or we'll call him Chill or Kill. But, uh, but yeah, Chilean, Melon and Chilean. Mm-hmm. Good. Anyone else? Mm. Mm-hmm. Played a lot at weddings. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. It's. It's. It is one of the most, I think, powerful 
passages in all the scripture, it's, 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 um, I mean, it's a just a tremendous statement. And when you, when you, if you can try and imagine the context, right? I mean, what she is leaving to go back, it's not, it's not a long journey, you know, but by foot, by, by camel or donkey or by, you know, travel, it's going to take a little bit of time to get back. Yeah, but it's, but it's leaving her life behind. Uh, it would be very much like a thousand mile journey to a whole different people group and way of life. So she would have grown up. You have to remember that the, the, the nation of Israel, when it settled into the land of Canaan, the reason it was to, to press out the people of Canaan is that they, they, there's a verse that says when the fullness of sin had come to its conclusion, God then brought forth Israel out of Egypt. And, um, and, and so the, the pluralistic view of worship of multiple gods was, had to be driven out from the land. And so as God established his place in his testament, and they didn't do that. They didn't do that fully. So they always constantly, the nation would, would succumb back to pluralism. They would, they, you know, they would claim we, we have one God, you know, from the Ten Commandments. We have one God. We worship him and him alone. But they lived out in a very plural way, worshiping multiple gods. And so they would pray to other gods for the harvest for the for the harvest for the rain the different things because that's what the people did around them and we fall fell prey they fell prey to that in our culture today we 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 are a post christian country that had a world view that believed a monotheistic view and that is one god but i promise you today even in the midst of many churches we don't hold to a monotheistic view. It's a, very, it's a very pluralistic view. It's a very pantheistic view that God is nature and nature is God. And so I mean, you will hear on award shows all the time people thinking God, but uh, Stephen Tyler of the band Aerosmith 20 years ago said, we want to thank God, whatever you may want to call him or believe him to be. So that's a very pantheistic view. It's this, this sense that, you know, there's something beyond us, and we don't know what it is. It can be anything. It can be lots of things. Um, and, and more often than not, it's connected to nature itself. And so it's a, it's a merging of a, of a naturalist and uh, Eastern type of, of philosophy merged together that we call pantheism. But it is a, it's a very pluralistic society, and that's what we engage today in, a society that holds a very plur, pluralic view when it comes to deity worship, if you would, you know, and so. The book says, I am God, and there is none else. Yes, and, and I absolutely believe that, but in our culture today, what we, we have a, a post-Christian culture. It's amazing that, that many, that a, the, the vast majority of the people in this country no longer believe that. What really concerns me is that there's a high percent in our churches that don't believe it. Now, I haven't, I haven't gone to look. I simply saw a friend of mine who shared a, 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 an article that stated half of the pastors that make up, that, that was surveyed across the country, believe there's more than one way to get to heaven than just through Christ. So it's a very pluralistic view. So it's kind of problematic when, when, when you have churches that those who are teaching would would hold to a view like that, and it's very problematic. He said, I am the way. What's that? Yeah, it, it is very true that there's there's become a great the sense of welcoming. We should be the most hospitable of all people, but hospitability means that we bring truth. Because truth is light, and so that's right. So I tell people who come to my office for counseling, I said, "This is a safe place, but please understand what I mean by safe. Safe is you don't just get to hide from your problems and do what you want to. Safe, a safe place is a place where truth is spoken. Because the only way that we can get to the heart of change is to bring truth into in, into the life, into the situation. So." Great thoughts. Why don't we listen to this song?
as you listen to it, when you, uh, when you hear the statement, just kind of, just sort of ignite, you know, or, you know, lift your finger. I'm going to sit down while we, while we sing it. But we'll come back and then we'll just make sure we got those all and then we'll close. So. Can I? 
It's called Land of the Living by Matthew Perryman Jones. I went to see him in concert, and he didn't even play that song. <laughs> it's like, how can you do that to me? So uh, first reference there, let down the scarlet cord. Rahab the harlot puts out the scarlet cord um, for the, the Israel. Uh, second one, dancing with dead man's bones, the, the vision of the, of the bones that need to come to life in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, the third one was the stones that are placed. Joshua, when he crosses the river, and he sets up those stones as a reminder for the, for the nation of Israel. And then the fourth one was, I think that was the fourth one. What was the other one? Oh, I kissed the ground and changed my name. I'm sorry, that was the third one. That was Jacob's name being changed from Jacob to Israel. So think it, this is a, so, and by the way, I think there's a fifth one. I'm not sure. I'd like to talk to him about this, but I think I'm coming home. I think it's a reference to the prodigal. And I think there could even be five. But if you think about Rahab's faith in hiding the spies and then putting out the scarlet's cord, if you think of God coming and, and breathing life into his people as broken, uh, dead. And, I, and you actually kind of see that, people so who are alive but feel very lifeless. Um, Jacob wrestling with God. You know, Jacob's name means one to deceive. And that was his testimony. What does his name become? Remember, he wrestled with God all night. And he said, I, I will not let go of you unless you bless me. And God did and changed his name to Israel, which means peace or prince with God. What a name change. You remember what he did to him? He touched his hip and he took it out of socket. My question a lot of times to the, the church is, what limp do you have that God's touched in your life that gets to put him? That's right. Put God on display. Um, the testimony of remembrance crossing the Jordan River, of the miraculous hand and provision of God. So, anyway, that song always encourages my heart uh, quite deeply, um, especially in times of sorrow and melancholy. So, uh, been a joy. Look forward to being back with you, Lord willing, in, in a couple of weeks, and just pray God's good grace and favor upon you. Let's join our hearts in prayer together. Father, I thank you for a very sweet time together. I thank you for your word, which is faithful and true. God, I pray that that which has been said that honors you would resonate and stir within our hearts. Anything said that was not of you, not faithful to your word, oh God, please remove that from mind or thought. Let our dwelling be upon that which is good, that nurtures that which is true and right. Holy Spirit, Speak to us clearly by taking truth and letting it be light for our path and a lamp unto our feet. God, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your kindness. We pray a blessing on this church. And um, God, ask that your good hand would be upon them in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen.